The year is 1241. The infamous Genghis Khan has recently conquered the city of Lahore, which is on an important trade route between the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent, although he can forgive himself for forgetting the names of the places he conquers. He has no mercy and no remorse for the people who stand against him. He feels no sadness and not even disgust at seeing rivers of blood and severed limbs. He's not bothered by the smell of burning flesh. And yet, for all the carnage that he saw today and all the wealth from the conquered city, there's one more thing he wants. He smiles as he watches a young woman, screaming, covered in blood, clothing ripped, being dragged to his bed. In a week, he would give this girl away to one of his officers, but she would already be pregnant. In a month, he will have forgotten her completely. She and her child won't even have the dignity of a passing thought from him. And why should he give them a passing thought? He has countless other children all across Asia. The year is 1961 in the Dominican Republic. The dictator, Rafael Trujillo, is about to die. He's lived his life more pridefully than anyone else I can think of. That is, of all the historical figures I can think of, this man has suffered the most self-consciousness. This is a man who wears platform shoes to make himself appear taller. A man who made it a crime to not have a picture of himself displayed somewhere in every home in his nation. A man who goes around with a military sash with a new medal awarded at every holiday and special occasion. A man who wears makeup to make himself appear less mulatto and more European. And yet, he's not satisfied to have his self-image enforced at gunpoint. He's not satisfied with complete control over a whole nation with an iron fist. He had a reputation for sleeping with the wives of his government officials, and even sleeping with teenage girls as young as 14 and sometimes younger. All this, along with the massive amount of political assassinations he's ordered done, give enough momentum to an underground resistance movement in his nation that they can successfully assassinate him. And now it's June 1954. The place is Kanjir, Kazakhstan, in the Soviet Union. The military has recently put down a prison revolt that lasted more than a month. One of the guards who was there before the revolt looks at all the prisoners who have been forced into submission. He overhears a report from one of the doctors. Most of the women in the camp had not been raped. That was astounding. When the prisoners took over the camp, when the men broke through the wall that divided them from the women's section, most of the guards were absolutely certain that these men, these vermin, these political prisoners, these enemies of the state, these traitors would have gone completely wild with sexual assaults. But he can't believe his ears. That hasn't happened. And what stopped them from doing it? Don't they want women? But then, an uncomfortable thought crosses his mind for just half a second. Were all of the guards projected Projecting what they would have done if they were in that position? He doesn't want to entertain that idea. He tosses it aside. Now what do all these things have in common with one another? The thing they have in common is depravity going hand in hand with itself. If you completely give yourself over to one vice, you're that much less prepared to resist any other. Genghis Khan had seen and committed more violence than almost anyone in history, and he must have felt less remorse than almost anyone in history. But that wasn't enough. He took any woman he laid his eyes on because he could. Trujillo murdered his way to the top. He committed racial genocide. He ordered countless assassinations of political opponents and subversives. But that wasn't enough for him. He slept with almost any woman he laid his eyes on because he could. And these Soviet prison guards, they took essentially innocent people, people who were thrown in prison, for example, because a neighbor who they had a disagreement with might have denounced them because the neighbor didn't want to be arrested. They wanted brownie points with the police. So the police listened to the neighbor's denouncement and arrested the other person just on suspicion, or they could have been arrested for being the first one to stop applauding at a Communist Party event. They might have been arrested on suspicion of purposely not putting out enough work output for the nation, suspected economic sabotage, and those people arrested for those reasons were given some of the most humiliating, dehumanizing treatment I know of, and they have the audacity to be surprised when the male prisoners don't rape the women when they have the opportunity. If you let yourself get lost in one type of evil, you are that much more susceptible to another type. But then, the opposite is also true. If you make progress in one kind of personal development, you are that much more prepared to make progress in other areas as well. So, cleaning your room, like Jordan Peterson tells us, that is not that far from committing to working out every day. Working out every day is not that far from committing to saying less swear words. Saying less swear words is not that far from giving to charity, or doing something nice for your spouse, or being more patient when you talk to people, being less annoyed and snapping at them less. One good thing leads to another, and when we build one good habit, it makes us that much more prepared to build on others. A quote from C.S. Lewis, the smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months 
later, you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of." End quote.